Hello and welcome to our broadcast titled Redis Enterprise Flash, Scaling Data Size with Redis Enterprise at Near RAM Latencies. It's a pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Shihan Bikalu, Redis Labs Vice President of Product Management. Storing large data sets in hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes can be costly with Redis Enterprise. Now you can store large data sets on Flash with better economics with Redis Enterprise Flash. In this session, Shihan will explain how Redis uses Flash as a RAM extension and how Redis Enterprise compares to other disk-based systems such as RDBMS engines or some of the other NoSQL databases like MongoDB or Cassandra. Today's broadcast is being recorded. Following today's event, an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you for sharing with your fellow workmates. We will be taking questions throughout the broadcast. There is a question and answer feature in the control panel that you can use to post questions. Questions will be answered in the order that they are received. Thank you for joining us today, and at this time, I'll turn the broadcast over to Shihan. Shihan, take it away. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks for joining the webcast. Um, Sharon, Sharon did a great job summarizing what we'll, we'll talk about. I'll, I'll just do a quick intro. Um, I'm a bit of a database geek. I've uh, been in the database industry for uh, uh, 20 years or so. I've worked on six of these products. Um, uh, Illustra, Informix, SQL Server, uh, SQL Azure, uh, Couchbase, uh, and Redis. I, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Redis and how um, we uh, were extending this technology uh, to new fronts. Uh, what I'll go through, let me, let me kind of rewind back to the top. What I'll go through is just give you a quick intro of uh, uh, the company and, uh, and the core technologies we've built. Uh, and show you some of the customers we have today. Uh, then I want to dive into this question of uh, uh, in-memory databases and how um, uh, the paradox of building large databases can be, uh, can be an issue. Uh, in-memory databases are obviously loved for their performance, um, but RAM is expensive. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the uh, frame of this problem uh, and uh, we'll talk about how, how we're actually solving it. Um, in the architecture section, I want to I wanna peel back the layers and, and show you a little bit under the hood of what uh, the architecture of this looks like, how it is different uh, from some of the other databases that you may have seen. And uh, give you a quick demo uh, just to show you how easy it is to manage this. Uh, and I'll close with uh, some performance data. Uh, I just want to share some benchmark information um, and uh, talk about uh, customers who, uh, who have actually uh, used this product today. Uh, and we'll do a Q&A at the end, but feel free to uh, jump in and ask questions at any time. We'll, I'll, I'll try to take them as they come in as uh, quickly as possible. All right, let's kick in. Um, so quick intro to our company. Uh, we're the uh, commercial company behind open source Redis. Um, we um, contribute to the open source in, in great ways, um, and it's at the core of our product. We also build an enterprise platform uh, that powers our product. Um, uh, the enterprise platform extends the open source in many ways. It makes scaling, performance, high availability easier. Um, you'll see that we, we run this technology in the cloud, so uh, we've got a great tenancy model, uh, a flexible tenancy model that we've uh, implemented into, um, into the enterprise platform, security, et cetera, all the things that you would expect from, uh, for, for a mission-critical deployment of Redis. So those are the things that we, uh, we're building. In terms of products, <clears throat> um, we, we have a core platform called Redis Enterprise. Uh, that's the Redis E that you see in the middle. Uh, now, we provide the same platform uh, for as managed services in the cloud, um, on all the clouds that you probably recognize from um, Azure to AWS uh, to Heroku, um, as a managed service. Uh, and in this case, all you need to tell us is where, what part of the world you'd like this database to exist in and, and we'll create it for you and manage it for you. Um, and you get to choose um, how you want to access this data and how much data you want to put in. And those, those are the things that we, we ask you to configure. Uh, but pretty much all the, all the management is on us. Um, the uh, cloud, private cloud management uh, platform um, allows us to be in your own compute, in, in your compute. And uh, we still do the management for you. So um, it's uh, in, in this case, you own your own data. Um, we, we save it to your infrastructure, uh, but we do the management for you uh, completely um, 
uh, under your your own compute. On the right side, um, you see on-premise products that we provide, and uh, and again, it's, it's supported by the Redis Enterprise technology. Um, and it's the same technology that powers the cloud, except in this case, you uh, take it to your own private data centers, and you can deploy it yourself and manage it yourself. Um, uh, or uh, we have uh, options for us to manage it for you in your own infrastructure, in your private uh, private cloud. Now, the flash technology that I'm going to talk about uh, applies to all three at the right side of the slide, um, and you can get this technology in all um, all three um, uh, all three product lines. Um, this technology is mature. We've been with Redis for uh, quite a long time uh, at the moment. Uh, just to give you size and scale of what we do uh, these days, is uh, we have over 250,000 databases that we manage. Um, we get uh, more than 600 databases a day uh, that is created, and uh, we've survived many, many node failures in the cloud um, and um, outages uh, without any data loss. So. Um, it's an impressive technology, and we uh, this is um, it's continuing to grow at a pace. Uh, we have over 7,000 paying customers, and the services are the are the on-premise side of the house. Um, we also have a free tier, so uh, there's over 60,000 accounts today uh, on uh, on Redis Cloud, and and it continues to grow. And the free tier um, is is quite popular uh, worldwide. And uh, this is a quick uh, logo wall uh, just to show you the industries that we exist in and, and the variety and, and diversity of, of the technologies we support, uh, the solutions we support in various industries from financial services to retail to travel. Um, Redis is obviously extremely popular. These are uh, customers who are using uh, Redis enterprise technology. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So. Let me uh, let me begin to why uh, we built uh, this technology. Now, the if if I ask many of our customers or or generally um, uh, anybody who's using Redis, they'll they'll immediately uh, come back with uh, the performance of Redis as, as one of the things that they love about it. Um, the in-memory database um, and its nature is is really to use RAM extremely efficiently and provide low latency response. Um, it's run by customers sometimes uh, to take the beating in front of other databases. Um, uh, so you know, databases that can't scale, we can we can put it in front and allow them to scale um, in in a caching uh, kind of bumper uh, area. Uh, and for some other customers, we're the primary data database uh, where they actually keep all of their data. Uh, but in both cases, RAM. And this, this in-memory nature of the database, even though it provides great um, predictable performance characteristics, it's quite expensive. Um, so building large databases can actually be a challenge. Um, so you always have to ration your data. You have to decide uh, what, what, what kind of things to keep. Uh, but we'd like to make it much cheaper uh, and bring a lot more data um, into, uh, into Redis Enterprise. The, the expense of RAM, I mean, the next best thing um, to RAM is Flash. And uh, there's about a 10 to 20x difference in terms of performance per gigabyte uh, for this. So it's it's quite a hard challenge to build large databases with in-memory databases um, like Redis. But um, to to further drill into this fact, uh, this is a quick chart that shows the uh, gigabyte dollar um, uh, for each one of the technologies. You uh, you see DRAM on the very left. Um, this is actually an optimistic price. Uh, depending on where you get it, uh, you may actually be up to twenty dollars per gigabyte. Uh, but it's it's a fairly expensive technology. The, the latency characteristics are are fantastic. Um, as you go to NVDIM or NVMe um, storage, you can see uh, that the price per gigabyte drops. And and these technologies on the right, uh, the SSD and flash based technologies are are expanding. And, and improving their latencies greatly, and their prices are improving too. Um, so we think there's a great way to combine uh, RAM and Flash together uh, to be able to serve data sets, much larger data sets, with, uh, with a cheaper deployment um, of infrastructure. And that is Redis Enterprise Flash. Um, so what Redis Enterprise Flash does is, is essentially allows you to bring massive data sets in and near RAM latencies at a drastic low, low, lower cost. What what it fundamentally does is extends RAM into Flash, 
and I'll, I'll dig into the specifics of how this is different than, let's say, a, a relational database with a buffer cache. Um, but, but this extension is extremely efficient uh, for us to be able to push uh, the data and the latencies uh, really low and use the flash storage effectively with all of its capabilities. Um, it's also future-proof. Um, some of the persistent memory technology, uh, like through the Crosspoint that's um, coming online uh, in the next few years, uh, we think that um, RAM is, is going to be, um, RAM and Flash are going to converge, and uh, we're, we're going to have a great set of capabilities here that, um, that can power you um, through the next shift, next wave in hardware. Um, so just let me, let me talk a little bit more about um, uh, the price and the cost effectiveness of, of this. It's fairly obvious if you look at the two machines on the left side of this uh, of the slide. The top machine has uh, one terabyte of memory. Uh, the bottom machine only has one tenth. And um, this is actually a fairly optimistic calculation of 80% savings here uh, between the two machines. But um, <clears throat> it's um, it's pretty obvious as to where the savings savings come from. Now. Here's a bit of a detail on, uh, on one of the ways you can calculate the difference between the two. Um, in this calculation, we've, we've actually taken a 10 terabyte data set, um, and we've picked up uh, the best type of instance on AWS um, that is tuned for um, RAM uh, with the lowest price uh, for RAM per gigabyte. That's the X1 series um, that you see over here, uh, versus uh, a series that's, um, that has a balance of flash and RAM um, that's the i3 series that you see. Um, these are MVME uh, drives that AWS provides. And if you uh, look at the quick calculation here, um, it's pretty simple to see there's uh, over 5x price improvement um, between the two. So the 81% savings here uh, is pretty easy to follow. Um, all right, so um, let's take a look at how we actually do it. So, so the premise uh, here is uh, if you're building a large data set, um, and you want to put that data uh, in low latency access um, into, into an in-memory database like Redis, we can now achieve that um, much cheaper and still keep your latencies um, uh, very efficient. Um, but let's, let's go back and, and understand how this actually works and how, how it actually achieves this um, capability. So um, I'll, I'll take you through uh, the story of the Redis enterprise architecture here. I'll start with the cluster at the top. Uh, the cluster technology um, formed of um, similar nodes. Um, they, they are identical in nature, so it's, it's very easy to scale this, this cluster just by adding new nodes. Um, within each node, um, we have the same uh, capabilities, and um, you get to choose your distribution, the databases, et cetera. But the um, red section that you see at the bottom uh, runs the shards. Uh, there are many Redis engines that run within each node. Uh, the sizing depends on the capacity of each node, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the characteristics of Redis and how you, how you do the sizing. And the blue layer that you see is uh, the cluster orchestration layer. So there's uh, connectivity management, um, there is health management and governance of the cluster, um, stats and alerts collection, um, et cetera, uh, throughout this, um, this area, and, and manageability APIs. Those, those are the things that uh, reside in the, in the blue area. All right, let's zoom into one of these nodes. So um, the Redis shards at the bottom are very close to open source. So I'll, I'll in, a, in a few slides, I, I want to show you how the Flash-based uh, Redis shards are different um, than the open source shards. Um, at the blue layer, um, there are three important components I want to I call out here as we zoom into the node. Uh, one is proxy. Uh, proxy, um, the, the Redis enterprise cluster is uh, completely compatible uh, with open source Redis. Um, you can take an existing open source Redis application, just change your connection string, and point it at a Redis enterprise cluster. And the proxy is the magic that really uh, glues it all together. So um, proxy um, governs the high efficiency connection back and forth between clients um, and the, uh, the cluster environment. It scales our connectivity. Uh, and uh, it has magic in there to improve on top of Redis performance. Um, uh, there's, um, there's, you, you can look at our documentation about uh, pipelining and connection management uh, that Proxies does, but it's, it's uh, really where majority of our IP um, is. 
the cluster manager component is the governance layer. Um, you um, essentially the, the you know the the, the the capabilities here is is really to orchestrate failures and um, uh, failovers, uh, ensure that we can uh, gather stats, uh, detect issues in a timely manner, and fix them. Uh, but the governance capabilities up at the uh, cluster level are um, uh, are quite sophisticated, um, and uh, there, there's even capabilities here that uh, allow us to protect you against um, noisy neighbors and uh, do um, uh, smart placement, essentially, of, of the shards um, so that you can run many small and large tenants within this cluster um, and, and still be easily able to control how uh, they're serviced out of the computational capacity that you're running your cluster on. And finally, um, it's the uh, management APIs. Uh, the, we, we have a secure uh, REST API and a UI layer uh, that visually allows the administrator to see into the cluster. Uh, gives, I'm, I'm going to walk through this. So uh, there's great indicators of health um, at top levels and then uh, great alerts to, to kind of let you drill into the specific area of problems and allow the administrator to interfere. Um, and it's all done over HTTPS, so it's, uh, it's a secure area. All right, I'm, I'm going to drill in even further into Redis now. Um, uh, the reason I want to do this, I, I, I want to show you where um, uh, the RAM versus RAM plus flash um, difference is. Um, I'll, I'll start with just general Redis architecture. This, this really isn't all that different at the top level in terms of components. Um, but uh, the, the top layer that you see, this process space, are, are the major components of Redis. Um, we have a listener. Obviously, this, this is how connections come in, and this is uh, the ports we listen in. Um, Redis is a main event loop at the top. This is um, the single-threaded nature of Redis. It's, it's a log-free architecture. It is essentially built around the event loop. Um, all the events get logged here, and uh, they're serviced uh, directly out of the event loop. Now, majority of the events that land here on a busy system um, is command execution. So on the left side, you see the connection handler, which is responsible for the efficiency of connection back and forth with the, uh, with the client applications. Um, once we formulate the connection together, the commands that arrive from that connection uh, are received by the command parser. Um, and then at the bottom layer, uh, they, uh, on the left side of the picture, you see the modules dispatcher or the command dispatcher. These are the components responsible for executing uh, the specific commands once the parsing is done. Um, the modules area, I'll, I'll zoom into that for a second. Um, this is the native extensibility that we've built into uh, Redis. It's coming with 4.0 as, as part of the stable release. And um, uh, this is the area where uh, you can actually embed your own data types and, um, and, and your verbiage on top of that data type and methods. Um, directly into the Redis engine. This extensibility is extremely powerful, and we're building a lot of solutions um, uh, that will allow um, developers to work with JSON or machine learning data um, much more easily within Redis. And um, this, this frees you from the, the shackles of you know, one underlying common denominator data type. So um, things like tables, rows, and columns, which is the common denominator for a relational database, or um, a document, a JSON document for modeling all of your data. Uh, you, don't, you don't have these in, in Redis. Redis is all about structures and, and uh, native structures that service the specific needs of the developer. And the modules area is where, uh, where this, this um, gets amplified, where uh, everybody can, can inject certain things in. Uh, all right, so that was the left side of the picture. There's, still, there's a set of background services that also run. Um, these are things like expiry, where we have to manage um, asynchronous events. Um, this, this picture is obviously an oversimplification of the architecture, but um, expiry is uh, where you can set a specific time uh, limit for a data to exist and, and disappear from the database. It's very useful. Uh, but there's um, essentially background services that manage and, and scan for um, expirations or evictions when they're needed. Uh, out of the database, depending on the eviction setting of, of the database. Replication is a major um, uh, background service that needs to communicate the data eagerly um, to slaves uh, from a master shard so we can get redundancy and um, durability to replication. So you can, your, your data can exist in multiple nodes and we can protect you against, against uh, node level failures. And uh, there are background services for um, 
this guy out. This guy is a specifically is is uh, a slower operation. So um, th there are two types of uh, this guy that the engine does. Um, one is called append only file format, and and in this form we we essentially append to the end of the file all the changes, all the commands that are being uh, that are changing the data. Uh, or you can you can use snapshots, which are essentially uh, point in time copies. Um, and I I'm doing. Uh, uh, rabbit, rabbit ears here, but uh, the point in time snapshots of your data uh, that's taking to this. So this is the, the general architecture of Redis um, shard. Now, if you look a little further down to the to the storage space, um, the data, uh, the keys and values that you you store uh, reside in RAM, and um, in kind of an in RAM. Um, uh, approach uh, all the keys. I, I actually kind of oversimplified the uh, the value types here. Some maybe strings or hashes or lists or sorted sets. Um, uh, but all of these uh, are maintained within within RAM, uh, and the disk subsystem essentially, based on the configuration of the database, uh, will receive either AOFs or um, uh, will just be used as temporary storage uh, if you don't want disk durability, uh, or will receive snapshots depending on the configuration of the database. So this is, um, we, we zoom all the way into the Redis shard now. Let me show you what uh, the Flash-based shard looks like. Now, at the top level, the process space is not all that different, uh, even though there are differences, there are major differences in the way we manage background services here. Um, but the main difference I want to highlight here is, is the shades of gray that you see in the, in the storage space. Uh, so the Flash and RAM, in this case, um, are, um, amalgamated together, if you will, and uh, essentially it's one continuum. Uh, it turns out that we can uh, sniper shoot specific values into Flash, and um, those values that are colder, that are rarely accessed, can actually reside on the Flash side. And if they're accessed again, um, we actually pay a little extra cost to bring them back into RAM and uh, do the processing. In, in the next slide, I'm, I'm actually going to walk you through in detail how a read and write operation happens and what, what the difference here is. Uh, but just wanted to show you at a high level um, what the storage um, architecture looks like uh, when Flash is enabled. All right, so let's let's drill into uh, kind of the workflow of a read and write. We'll we'll, we'll just kind of um, dig into this. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the slide again, uh, just walking you through. So uh, the the gray boxes you see are Redis applications, and let's assume that they're submitting a command. Uh, now, on, on step one, the, the app has a couple of options. There's um, pipelining operations where they can submit multiple um, operations at the same time. There's also words that are single key scoped, um, like get or set, um, or there, there are multi-key operations that they can submit. Um, there's verbiage like mget or um, exists or touch, uh, which will take multiple keys and will be able to kind of work on them. Um, on step two, the proxy receives this information, and um, it has many shards uh, within the cluster. Um, those shards can be local or could be somewhere else within the cluster, but the, sh but the proxy is smart enough to understand the placement within, uh, within the cluster, even understand when there is movement and, and changes to the topology, so execution doesn't stop when you're adding nodes, removing nodes, or moving shards from one node to another. Uh, but the proxy's job is, is really to find the right shards for the operations that it received and execute them in parallel. Um, it's extremely efficient. Uh, it also takes advantage of many commands it receives from many clients all at once to pipeline that information to the relevant shard. So if you can imagine, um, you know, there's a lot of tricks we play here um, to, to make the communication to the specific shards very efficient. If there are 15 applications that are um, trying to reach into the same shard, the proxy has some efficiency in being able to execute those 15 commands directly into that shard in, in one shot. So it has its own pipeline logic in step two. Now in step three, um, all shards go through the processing that uh, you've seen at the top um, in, the, in the kind of process space of, of Redis. It's the connection handler, the command parser, the dispatcher modules um, that, that actually uh, the dispatchers for modules and, and commands that, that receive and execute these commands uh, in, in um, the Redis's kind of in-memory fast block free architecture. Uh, and they start assembling the results back into, uh, back into the proxy. 
Now, in, in the case of an all RAM setup, uh, this shard will have everything it needs, all the data it needs in RAM. Um, in the case of a flash uh, based setup, um, the values may, may actually reside in the flash side of the uh, storage. Um, so in those cases, um, there's actually great stats I'll, I'll show you um, that indicate when this happens and, uh, in, in, um, and when, when you can actually have a better hit ratio in RAM. Uh, but in those cases, what we do is we bring the value itself, whether that's a hash or a list or, or some custom type, but we actually bring that back into, um, uh, into the RAM and we do the processing there. And, and this is called a, a RAM fault. Um, uh, we, we have a great indicator that I'll show you in a second called uh, percent RAM hit ratio, uh, which shows you how many of the operations that you submit into the engine are satisfied by all data that's already in RAM versus how many of uh, the, the percent of uh, the operations that actually um, uh, experienced a uh, flash retrieval operation. Now, there's, uh, again, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying here the, the event execution. There's replication and a whole bunch of other things that, that happen, but step three is, is kind of assembling of those results back into proxy. And eventually, uh, step four is proxy responding back to the client that submitted uh, the set of operations. Um, with the results. So this is um, this is how the cluster works. There are many nodes involved here. Again, many shards involved, and um, you know the proxy is uh, perfectly capable of reaching into multiple um, multiple shards, even with multi-key operations uh, like mget and and uh, assembling those results uh, back to the client. So the client application here could have been uh, a an open source Redis application uh, that had changed its connection string to point at Redis Enterprise cl Enterprise cluster, and maybe working directly off of that. Anyway, all right, so this is um, um, the inner workings of, of what we have uh, in, in, in Redis. Now, what I'd like to do is just walk you through um, a little bit of what uh, it looks and feels uh, like when, when you actually are on, um, on the product itself. So I'll, I'll start with um, this picture. This is uh, the interface for um, Redis, um, Redis Enterprise Pack. Um, uh, this is the on-premise version of the product. I, I just want to show you a little bit of the inner working, so it, it actually helps me to have uh, Redis back here, but you can assume pretty much uh, the fundamentals are the same in Redis Cloud, uh, part of the product as well. Both are um, powered by Redis, Redis Enterprise at the back. Um, over here you see statistics for the cluster. Um, this is a cluster-wide set of statistics that show you what the percentage of CPU usage is, uh, how much memory you've got um, uh, free, um, how much RAM versus flash. Um, so you can see that at the top level. When you enable flash, we, we actually give you additional stats uh, on how, how this is, the free disk space, et cetera. So at the top level, you also get an indicator of um, health uh, for the cluster. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a view of the notes. Uh, you can also get these stats uh, per node. So you can drill into each one of these nodes and get node-level statistics. So at the top level, I can, I can specifically go to each one of my nodes and do a, see exactly what each one of those nodes has, um, as opposed to the cluster summary that we've looked at a second ago. Now, under databases, um, you see the list of databases that you create. Now, um, in, in, I've, I've, this is a very minimal set of hardware. In fact, I'm, I'm actually running, the, running this on Docker on my laptop, so uh, don't expect a, a whole lot of load or, or anything like that. Um, there's just one single database. This is actually a Flash database I created, uh, just to show you what it feels like to administer one of these things. So let's um, drill into uh, the configuration first. Let me, let me take you through that. Um, let's edit it so we can we can kind of scroll through the list. So uh, this is a database called uh, DB1 on Flash. Um, you, you can see I've just created this. Um, there's an endpoint. Uh, this is the endpoint that you can connect to to talk to this database. Um, there could be multiple endpoints as well that, that you can configure. It's up to the configuration of the cluster to, uh, to really give you that. Um, there's only between a RAM versus RAM plus Flash database, um, there's only one difference. Um, it's this dial here, and uh, the memory limit is, is for essentially storing, um, configuring the amount of data that this database can hold 
Um, but with the RAM limit, uh, you get to choose exactly what percentage. I'm getting to get a warning here, but I'm, I'm going to ignore it. This is an empty database. Uh, you get to choose how much of your data resides in RAM versus flash. So you can go all the way up to 50, which means half of your data will be, um, so 5 gigabytes of this data will be in RAM and 5 gigabytes will be on flash. Or you can um, limit RAM to be um, down to 20% or 10%. Um, so this is this is as easy as it gets. You can actually change this on the fly. Um, if you see that your workload changes over time and the working set that you have, um, let, let me explain this term working set. It's um, majority of the customers that we look at, um, even though they have you know millions of keys in Redis, um, you will realize quickly that let's say only a subset of these keys are active. Uh, there's only so many people log into your site every day. Um, you know, even though you may have millions of millions of accounts, um, you only have a subset of those folks who are coming in all the time. So the working set um, uh, typically identifies the active portion of your data. And uh, typically, uh, the recommendation is to keep active portion of your data uh, in, within the RAM limit. So the RAM should be large enough to be able to accommodate that. And over time, that is changing. Obviously, there's going to be new users signing up to your service. And if Redis is the authentication um, authorization platform for you, then um, those users, as they become active, uh, may actually get created. And some other users may actually leave the site or may, may become cooler or may not come back as often. Um, and those guys get pushed off the flash. And this is how the magic of placement of, of the values um, is, is decided, is, is the access pattern. And you get to control um, you know, what, what level of RAM versus flash commitment you have to make uh, within each database, um, et cetera. There's uh, obviously database clustering settings. This is uh, the number of shards you want to run. So with the replication enabled, I'm running 20 shards, um, 10 of them active, 10 of them uh, slaves. Um, I can specify um, eviction. Uh, policy here. Uh, data persist persistence was off for this, uh, but I can I can also have persist data residing on disk um, if, if I want to take snapshots or AOF uh, with um, uh, with my database. And this option specifically, I want to I want to just call out. Uh, this is unique. Um, so uh, we actually are able to keep uh, your data as you write each one of the changes to your shards. Uh, we can actually sync it to disk, um, and there. Are, there are various ways in which we actually uh, make this efficient. Um, uh, I won't get into that today, but um, there's there's a number of durability options with each database uh, and alerts um, up here. All right, so let me let me take you to stats now that we've looked at uh, what it looks like. The stats on the database are different um, than the cluster. It's um, at this top two portions. Um, you can pull anything below uh, in the details level up for better visibility. Um, these are all the stats you would expect from a uh, from a database. I just want to focus more on the flash-based statistics here. So uh, we were talking about the RAM hit ratio. Uh, that's an important stat. So if you see RAM hit ratio is about 50%, and 50% of your operations are suffering from having to fetch the data from flash, it may be a good indication that your, um, your RAM is not enough. Uh, for the working set that you're um, you're doing, so it's a good indicator uh, that we uh, typically tell customers to, to kind of slide to the right, so that we can have more RAM and um, you can you can expand the database to, to have more flash as well. But um, you can, you can have more RAM to be able to improve your latencies here. Um, and the only side effect I, I should say of of um, you know a flash uh, fetch is is the latency. So you will you will actually notice the the latency of it, um, but that latency is much different uh, compared to the latency of a disk-based system. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that in, in a few slides, but uh, I just want to kind of bring that up, that this latency that we have for streaming flash values is very different, very different compared to a disk-based system, uh, disk-based database system like um, relational databases or MongoDB or Cassandra, which, which operate mainly on, on top of disk. So uh, we're keeping the in-memory nature of of Redis uh, alive with this technology. All right, um, there's a couple of things that we can we can look at uh, in the command line. I um, I'm actually running this on Docker just to see. Uh, th these are the tree nodes that are alive. Uh, I've been running them for a while. 
Uh, we just shipped this preview. If you're interested, you can you can go to a Docker Hub and search for Redis Labs, uh, and you'll find the Redis um, um, Redis container there to be able to run it on your Mac or Windows. Um, if I go into uh, one of these nodes that are running on my local machine, so let's do a um, Docker exec. Um, uh, this is this is one of these nodes. So I'll, I'll go into the Redis Labs uh, folder. Um, this is where the binaries reside uh, uh, with the installation. Um, so let me run um, RL admin. This is the main way in which you can actually get um, kind of a similar visibility uh, just through command line into the cluster. So uh, the most common command is uh, status. And let me scroll up so you can. Uh, I can walk you through the sections. These are the nodes that we have, the three nodes. Uh, this is information about the database, and these are the shards, the Redis shards that are running, and whether they're masters or slave, or what portion of the hash slots they are servicing, uh, all visible through here. And the indicators of health um, are also up here to, to give you a good and high-level overview of what the cluster is doing at the moment. So this is a quick tour of the UI and a quick tour of the command line capabilities uh, that we have. So uh, let, me, let me switch back to the slides. Um, this is my last section. What, what I'd like to focus on here is just show you um, uh, a little bit of the performance characteristics of this environment. So we've, we've seen um, the, the flash capability and how it helps uh, building large data sets within memory databases. We've seen how it actually works uh, from an architectural standpoint. Uh, but let's take a look at the performance characteristics here. So this is, um, I'll take a moment to describe the test environment here. Uh, this is uh, over 3 million operations per second on a single node. Uh, it's an E5 server from Intel, two sockets, 44 cores. Um, this is a powerful machine. Um, the latency characteristics here are very interesting. So it's not just 99 percentile, it's 99.99 percentile of all the operations were below a millisecond latency when we were running 3 million operations on this database. And the workload uh, was, obviously, this was a flash-based setup where 80%, um, sorry, 90% of the data was on flash. Um, we were experiencing some amount of um, uh, cat, uh, RAM hint ratio um, on this. Um, and, and the workload that was hitting the environment was 80% reads and 20% writes. Um, this shows you uh, the the level of performance you can achieve with something like this, uh, where you're able to keep a very large set of data online with Redis in an in-memory fashion, and um, as long as you're um, you're you you have uh, the capacity, the storage capacity. There were actually four drives in this configuration: uh, NVMe drives, four NVMe drives from Intel. As long as you have the uh, configuration, you're able to maintain extreme low latency and a snappy application, a, a, a much more interactive, much more engaging application for your users. All right, that, um, I'm going to spend a few minutes just describing why why it is so so much faster compared to a relational database that would be running on this node, for example. Right, three million operations are are um, quite interesting to achieve, uh, but there's fundamental differences in the way we use Flash as a RAM extension, and this base databases use their database uh, storage platforms, even if it's Flash, right? And and in each line, I'm I'm going to take you through the differences. And one of the big differences is the hot value handling. So imagine a workload where um, you have the same users coming into your website over and over again um, as you're auditing what they're doing or or recording what they see on your website and how they flow through it. Um, the the information um, could be updating the same key with um, basically, essentially, with a lot of information. So, as you go back to the same key and, and update it continuously, these hot values on your on your working set. Um, in in the case of Flash, they reside in RAM. So there's no corresponding I/O to the to the Flash drive because these values are in RAM. We we can completely operate on them uh, within uh, within the RAM space, and we don't have to issue I/O requests into the flash. Now, in a disk-based system, this would be a very different characteristic. So let's say if, you're, you know, if your popular users keep coming back to the site, uh, the hot values that you have to continuously write to to keep track of these users 
on a durable rights-based system, uh, like a disk-based system, like um, uh, Oracle's um, informing SQL Server or MongoDB, uh, would have to eventually write a, a, a change record uh, um, into, um, into the storage. So whether you know, this value has been updated 15 times, there's going to be I.O. activity that's generated to maintain this value on disk constantly. In our case, because this value is being maintained in RAM and we don't have to put those um, hot values onto flash or record them onto flash, there's really no I.O. that we have to generate. So the I.O. bandwidth is saved for other types of um, uh, RAM hit ratio um, uh, or, or RAM faults uh, that you experience. That means you can actually retrieve values um, without this, um, this additional I.O. getting in the way. Um, we actually use behind the scenes uh, for the flash storage. We use RocksDB on, on some of the platforms. On the power platform, we, we have a different uh, configuration. So it's a pluggable storage engine architecture for the flash side. Um, but the way we write with RocksDB versus in, in the flash configuration versus a disk-based system writing a durable change into, um, into disk is very different. Um, we configure RocksDB in ways uh, that allow us to bypass um, a, a, the requirements of durable writes. Things like um, write ahead logs or redo logs are not things we have to maintain. We, we can actually bypass those things. So the, 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 the final kind of uh, quick summary of this is the write amplification that you see uh, with the writes from Redis Enterprise Flash is much smaller compared to the write amplification that you see uh, from this base database. The single write to a single key will amplify to fewer writes uh, fewer IOPS into disk uh, in our case versus much larger IOPS um, in a relational database or a disk-based subsystem, uh, disk-based database that, that you have. Um, the third point that I want to stress here is um, the cloud architecture storage. So um, if you're running in the cloud, it is very typical um, that you will have an ephemeral drive that's local to the machine, but this is not uh, guaranteed to, to uh, live forever. Um, and an attached storage, a network attached storage that allows you to uh, have durable writes with copies uh, that are protected. Now, we can put our durable writes into the network drive and we have efficiency working with such configurations. We, we run in the cloud with, uh, with great effectiveness. But Redis uh, Enterprise Flash technology is the best way to utilize the local storage. Um, we actually don't require a guarantee of the flash surviving uh, through a restart. So um, we're able to utilize the ephemeral drive much more effectively uh, for local writes and none of our writes to flash are ever network writes in, in the cloud architecture versus if you look at a disk-based database, um, if, if you put your um, durable writes into ephemeral storage, um, sooner or later you're going to lose that data. So ephemeral drives are only possible to use for temporary storage and temporary data. Uh, with um, this base subsystems and they can't correctly utilize this technology well. Uh, the final point, I'm, I'm just going to repeat this, is uh, systems like 3D Crosspoint that are coming that, that actually will make memory persistent um, will in many ways validate the architecture that we have even further um, to allow us to work with um, essentially a persistent piece of memory. And these, these type of things really allow us to, um, uh, allow us to be ready and future-proof. All right, uh, the last um, slide I want to leave you with uh, is a case study from a customer who's, who's chosen Redis uh, Enterprise Flash. Um, it's uh, a, an app uh, called uh, Marco Polo. I've uh, used it. It's a video walkie-talkie application, um, and it's um, running on Redis. Uh, its uh, characteristics is such that it's hard to do some of these things with any other database but Redis, uh, 150 million uh, messages a month, um, 30 to 50,000 signups a day. And um, for Marco Polo, for John, uh, the important things were the effectiveness of Flash, obviously, you know, all, all the other things that come with Redis, which is high performance, the agility of development, the assurance um, uh, of uh, the, the ability to kind of uh, rapid fire development and test and simplified management. These were all the things that were uh, important attractions for, um, for John. Uh, but this is one case in which um, Redis Enterprise Flash has, has shown its effectiveness. Um, before I close, I, I just want to 
I'll let you guys know that uh, we have a conference coming up in San Francisco on uh, May 30th. Um, I'd like to invite all of you uh, here and please go to um, uh, redisconf.com to register um, today. If you uh, register early, uh, you've got some perks uh, at the bottom. Uh, it looks like a nice Amazon gift card that you may be able to qualify for. All right, um, this is it. Uh, this is my information. If you'd like to get a hold of me, I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, the questions that are coming in. I'm sorry, I, um, looks like I have a few. Um, the first question I see uh, is, um, I'm running open source Redis. Will my app need to change with Redis Enterprise Flash? Um, the answer is no. Um, the, um, the essential idea here is uh, the proxy technology that we have allows you to um, allows us to con completely hide uh, the magic that we do behind the scenes. Uh, we can scale this cluster, change the number of shards, uh, place them in different nodes, add new nodes, and, and rebalance. And <clears throat> all of these operations are uh, are transparent to the application. So you can simply point your existing Redis app, and things will just magically work. Um, Another question I see is, um, um, if I run on AWS uh, VPCs um, or in Google and GCE, um, how do I take advantage of this technology? Now, um, if you remember one of the earlier slides, I, I talked about Redis Cloud Private. Um, there are two options for you. One is you can deploy your Redis pack directly on these platforms yourself. Um, there are AMIs um, and, and scripts that will let you do that quickly. Um, or uh, you can choose our Redis Cloud private offering, where um, you can we can resurrect a um, Redis Enterprise instance, a set of clusters for you in your own compute, uh, and within your VPC you can own your data, but we get to manage it for you. So um, you know, with with all the SLAs that you expect from um, managed services, we can we can provide all of that to you on these platforms. Hopefully that, that answers the question. Um, another question I see is how do I migrate my data into Redis Flash? And um, we actually have, uh, if, if you're on Redis Open Source, we've got great capabilities for you to be able to do this. Um, we have a technology, a capability um, called Replica of that um, you essentially lets you point at um, Redis Open Source and pull your data directly into Redis Enterprise. Um, it's a transparent move, um, uh, seamless, so it's it's very easy to do this migration. And uh, Redis C Flash, as I said, in terms of access patterns, uh, from a contract standpoint, the API standpoint, the Redis API is the same. There's, there's nothing you realize except um, you know, behind the scenes, the Redis shard that we have acts differently. Um, so the last question I see here is, um, I'm using open source Redis, uh, but I can't use pipelining. Um, with with clustering, is, is your clustering able to do pipelining of Redis uh, Enterprise Flash? The answer is yes. Um, so Proxy is um, is in many ways more functional uh, because it hides the details of multiple shards behind it um, for uh, the application availability and efficiency of the connection. Um, we're able to give you pipelining directly out of the cluster. I think that's. That's pretty much it, unless there are any other questions. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll uh, hand it off to Sharon to close. Well, hey, thanks, Sheon. Great topic with uh, quite a bit of interest. To learn more about Redis and Redis Enterprise, register today uh, for Redis Conf 2017 at RedisConf.com and take advantage of the multiple sessions that are being uh, planned. Thank you again for joining us today. An email will be sent with the link to the recording of today's broadcast. For an overview of upcoming webinars, please re visit redislabs.com and register today. Bye for now.